Alan Fogel, and I'm the President and CEO of the Canadian Energy Research Institute. Welcome to our seminar, our webinar, on industrial competitiveness and energy efficiency. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, talk about the setup for the webinar so that uh, people are aware of it. Your microphones have been muted for the duration of the presentation. Uh, if you want to hear the webinar audio, choose mic and speakers uh, to use VoIP, and choose telephone and dial in, and the, and the dial-in numbers are provided for you. When we get to the question stage, uh, there's a, a question panel where you can type in your questions. I will then uh, uh, repeat the questions and then go ahead and uh, provide whatever answers are appropriate for that question. Um, so uh, we're just waiting for a couple of uh, people to sign into the webinar and we'll uh, uh, start the uh, presentation shortly. So give us uh, one more minute and then we'll be starting the presentation. <clears throat> Okay, um, thank you very much for joining our, our webinar. Uh, I'm gonna be taking you through the presentation, which should be about uh, 30 minutes, and then there'll be about 30 minutes for questions. Uh, as I noted before, there is a uh, 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 choices for your audio, uh, and it's either mic and speaker or telephone, and questions are uh, provided through a text, uh, questions at, in the question panel. Uh, just a quick uh, note about the Canadian Energy Research Institute. We've been around since 1975, so we're celebrating our 45th year, and we're very pleased about that. We uh, conduct a, a number of market studies, uh, as well as uh, we provide uh, geopolitical analysis in our uh, geopolitics of energy. And we have uh, crude reports that are included now in our new uh, quarterly uh, newsletter that provides information about the Institute as well as our studies and uh, different issues related to crude oil, electricity, and natural gas. <clears throat> as the organization is a not-for-profit uh, charitable organization, we depend on, on uh, donations from various organizations and you can see on, on this page uh, that we, we get uh, funding from a variety of sources uh, to support our activities. So I'm gonna take you through the analysis that we've conducted, a short introduction and then a little bit of information about the study scope and methodology. Uh, talk a little bit about the sectoral results. We did five sectors, but the presentation only includes two. Uh, the remainder and, uh, and all this information will be in our final report when we issue it in February. <clears throat> so energy efficiency has been uh, an issue for the industrial sector for several decades. Uh, the industrial sector accounts for a significant portion of the energy use in Canada. Most of that is in the form of uh, natural gas and electricity. And what we wanted to do here was to explore uh, in the current conditions what that means for some of the trade exposed uh, uh, companies that are highly energy intensive. When you look at the trade exposure uh, and the energy intensity, you can see that uh, the 
uh, on this slide, the GDP for manufacturing and mining contribution to Canada is quite significant. And their energy use is also significant. So there is a direct correlation between uh, energy use and industrial activity. You can also see that there's been a significant shift in the direction uh, of how the energy is being used. And primarily that is more natural gas being used uh, at the expense of some of the other sources, but not uh, electricity, because the electricity use has, has uh, uh, been reasonably constant over the, um, the 25 year period that we've identified here and it's only natural gas that's really increased. And that is in large part for process energy and feedstocks. So as we noted, uh, as we noted on this page, we, we've looked at uh, five of the more energy intensive sectors in industry, pulp and paper, iron and steel, aluminum production, chemical manufacturing, and bitumen extraction and upgrading. You can see that uh, the, these, the first four sectors, not including bitumen extraction, represent 75% of, uh, of industry and a significant trade exposure where energy is, is uh, uh, a significant part of the production costs, but uh, often less than, uh, than 20%. Normally you would find in low energy use industries or activities, somewhere where energy costs are in the range of, of one to three percent. In this case, we're talking about something more significant than that, upwards of 10 to 20 percent. Now, when we wanted to uh, put this information together, we had to develop an analytical framework. And you can see from, from this slide that uh, uh, the Historical data goes into setting our, our baseline activities. And then we looked at uh, technology options and estimates of energy efficiency uh, costs to really determine what would be available from the user's perspective. And so <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind here is that the cost of conserved energy is a financial cost. When we look at some of the energy efficiency programs that have been conducted by utilities or by governments, um, often the cost implications are economic, which is uh, what are the total costs to the system and how could those be reduced? In this case, we're only talking about what is the cost to the consumer, in this case, the industrial consumer. And therefore, you will see that when we identify the results, you'll find much fewer um, options that are cost effective from the consumer's point of view. And again, this is one of the issues that we face in Canada and actually uh, globally, and that is there's a, a disconnect between the, uh, the cost effectiveness of activities to reduce energy use from the customer's perspective versus a more broader economic perspective. When we look at pulp and paper, you can see that the production of, of uh, chemical, mechan chemical pulping, mechanical pulping, and newsprint and, and paper um, have been significant, but have been declining uh, overall. Uh, and that is in part because of the move away from uh, paper and, and newsprint for use in uh, our day-to-day -day lives. The GDP contribution has also gone down because the, the production levels have gone down. But interestingly, uh, as a result of uh, significant uh, changes in electricity use uh, in terms of its production, um, the GHG emissions have gone down. And we've also moved away from other uh, higher uh, GHG fossil fuels, such as oil and diesel, towards natural gas. This uh, slide uh, shows you that uh, the energy intensity has changed in chemical 
uh, pulping, there was a significant trend downward, which has taken an uptick uh, it, more recently since uh, 2010. Um, the newsprint mills have been pretty stable. Part of that reason is because of the, the um, uh, challenges for the newsprint industry to uh, actually remain profitable. And as a result, uh, there's oftentimes less money available for retrofits. Um, GHG emissions intensity, again, we see that going down, uh, mostly because of fuel substitution and not really because of energy intensity. However, there's a long way uh, to go in terms of uh, getting to best in class or best practiced uh, energy intensity. As you can see from this slide, uh, we have an average sector intensity that is in the uh, 40 to 50 gigajoules per uh, 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 megaton range. And uh, we see that the lowest observed in Canada is uh, in the low 20, sorry, in the high 20s, and the best in the world uh, is uh, less than 10 gigajoules. So there's there's significant uh, opportunity for uh, energy improvements or energy efficiency improvements uh, in Canada uh, from a from a Canadian perspective as well as from a global perspective. However, the thing to keep in mind is. Uh, just because there are technical options doesn't mean that they are financially viable. <clears throat> now, when we looked at the uh, energy efficiency options for the pulp and paper industry, we, we looked at both the thermal energy consumption and electricity consumption because in a lot of cases you can do uh, different energy efficiency options uh, in different parts of the industrial process. All of these options are commercially available and each option shows how much the, the energy intensity can be reduced and how much it costs. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that these costs are only the cost for these technical improvements and do not include costs associated with uh, shutting down the process in order to put these improvements in place. And we'll come back to that at a later point because that's that's a, a critical element in terms of uh, companies and programs being successful in putting in more energy efficiency in their activities. This slide uh, shows you the energy efficiency supply curve for pulp and paper. And uh, I'll be speaking about the, the specific options in on the next page. What I wanted to show here was because we're looking across the country, across Canada, um, being able to define what is the avoided cost in any uh, particular uh, um, jurisdiction is difficult. So what we've done is provide the supply curve or the cost curve, I should say, for energy efficiency. And that allows companies in different jurisdictions to assign their own break-even price. Right now, we've just used the price of, of natural gas uh, delivery, uh, which is uh, on average the $3.6 per gigajoule. And you can see at that point, we have 10 to 12 options that we considered that would be financially cost-effective. The other point to raise on this slide is we looked at the differences between those energy efficiency options that are cost effective uh, with and without carbon pricing. And with carbon pricing, uh, in this case for pulp and paper, you have uh, two additional uh, uh, activities that would be cost effective if carbon pricing is part of the uh, analysis. <clears throat> this slide shows you the, the specific um, uh, technologies we looked at. Uh, in terms of pulp and paper, things on here include continuous uh, digester modifications, bat batch digester modifications, preheating for uh, chlorine dioxide. 
The two in the dark green show the ones that become cost effective uh, from a financial point of view if you consider the uh, carbon dioxide or CO2 tax that could be in place at $30 a ton. And of course, this would change as the uh, carbon price increases uh, based on the federal government's policies. So when we look at uh, when we look at the overall conclusions related to the pulp and paper industry, uh, one thing is clear that carbon pricing can make a difference in terms of determining which of these energy efficiency improvements can be economical from the customer's perspective. The other point to, to uh, be clear about is that these are for average activities, and so facility level analysis is required. And a lot of the programs that governments and utilities actually work on these days includes facility level analysis to provide individual plant managers an understanding of how their own plant can be affected. So while these provide a good indication for uh, uh, plants within the pulp and paper industry, it is important to consider the fact uh, at the facility level because things will be different from one plant to another. Uh, the other element to know in the pulp and paper industry is that there's still a lot of uh, fuel used uh, through uh, wood waste and spent pulping liquor, and that's uh, a very low cost. In fact, it could be a cost of disposal to these companies. So using them as part of their overall uh, energy mix is an important aspect of their uh, competitiveness. <clears throat> and the point I mentioned before about the main caveat is that uh, this cost does not take into account lost revenue due to downtime. So in all these cases, if you take into account lost revenues, you could actually eliminate any uh, cost savings associated with energy efficiency if the, the changes are made in periods when the plant is supposed to be operating. So for the, for the most part, these energy efficiency uh, options should be considered uh, only when plants are going through their own regular maintenance and other retrofits for their business. Another area we looked at was uh, chemical manufacturing. And you can see here it's uh, 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 chemical fertilizer, uh, uh, with the exception of potash, is, is a significant uh, part of the sector. Petrochemical manufacturing is a small uh, component of the overall chemical manufacturing sector, although it's significant in a couple of provinces, in particular Ontario and Alberta. GHG emissions have been uh, fairly stable uh, over time uh, since the year 2000 uh, in both uh, chemical uh, fertilizer manufacturing and petrochemical manufacturing. The energy intensity of uh, chemical manufacturing has gone in two different directions. Uh, one uh, with respect to uh, petrochemical manufacturing has seen increased energy intensity and the other with respect to chemical fertilizer uh, has seen a decrease in energy intensity over a 25-year period. The GHG intensities are, are about equivalent to where they were uh, in 19, sorry, well they are closer to where they were in, in 1990 um, uh, for the petrochemical manufacturing has come down a little bit and has come down significantly in chemical manufacturing. So uh, we see that both sectors are making improvements in how they are managing their GHG emissions. When we looked at chemical manufacturing, we wanted to focus on, on a, a a few of the specific products, and, and we looked at uh, ammonia as the major feedstock for, for fertilizers. Um, uh, from this, uh, this uh, slide, you can see that the energy intensity 
for ammonia production has decreased drastically uh, over uh, the, its history. But as, as in the last uh, 10 to 15 years has been uh, reasonably stable. Uh, the other uh, point to, to note is that Canadian ammonia plants are uh, some of the best in the world in terms of energy intensity. And this is uh, something that Canada can be quite proud of as it moves uh, away from more uh, energy intensive processes to ones uh, that are more uh, efficient. Now, in this case, when we looked at the, the uh, uh, number of technologies that could be used to improve the efficiency of, uh, of uh, the ammonia production, we see that the, the, the cost of energy is a little different, and it's uh, $4.20 per gigajoule. We also see that uh, uh, there's fewer options available. So in the case of the no carbon pricing, uh, we see upwards of, of six uh, options available. Uh, with carbon pricing, you get in a couple of more, which is similar to what we saw in, in the pulp and paper. Now, um, in, from this slide, we, uh, we identified uh, uh, seven of the technologies that were effective in energy efficiency and also were cost effective. And you can see here we have heat recovery from flue gas, um, ammonia recovery technologies, uh, medium, uh, low, low temperature conversion technologies, and uh, changes to the ammonia synthesis process. For ammonia, you see that that uh, several of the technologies are are available to lower the energy intensity. Uh, natural gas price has a much more significant impact on the viability here uh, because there's uh, it, it's used for feedstock as well. Um, lower energy prices, not just for natural gas, but as we see lower commodity prices coming in for electricity due to lower natural gas fire generation means that it's, it's, there's a more uh, uh, stringent evaluation needed to understand whether these energy efficiency improvements are cost effective. Uh, the other point raised with respect to this one is that there's not much difference in terms of uh, the technologies that are available for cost effective energy efficiency improvements when you use carbon pricing and when you don't. The other point to raise here again is that the caveat is if you are having to shut down your process to uh, conduct these energy efficiency retrofits and you're not doing it for other reasons, that revenue loss needs to be counted against the savings associated with the energy efficiency. And if that happens, none of these activities would be cost effective. Also within manufacturing is primary metals. And we looked at uh, uh, iron and steel, as well as uh, aluminum. The energy intensity of aluminum is quite significant and it is in a lot of cases, uh, mostly electricity. But we see that uh, in terms of uh, Canadian production, uh, what's interesting is that there's a much more production activities associated with iron and steel than there is with aluminum. The GHG intensities have been very stable for the iron and steel mills uh, over the last 25 years, whereas the primary uh, aluminum has uh, decreased its GHG emissions intensity over time. GDP contribution. Sorry. GDP contribution uh, has, uh, uh, has increased for primary aluminum uh, in terms of the, the value to the Canadian economy. Um, the iron and steel mills have been uh, 
while they've been producing uh, at reasonably high levels, the, the value associated with the iron and steel in Canada has dropped as a result of uh, the international uh, overcapacity uh, for iron and steel production and has brought the, the value of those products down. Again, we see the cost curve associated with uh, aluminum production here and a different cost of energy uh, in part because the weighted cost here includes a significant amount of electricity. What's interesting about this chart is that carbon pricing has no impact on the number of technologies that would be cost effective in a aluminum production scenario. <clears throat> Here we note uh, in terms of the options available, you can see that uh, there are sensor upgrades that could be conducted, furnace pressure controls, efficient operation of burners, waste heat recovery, and optimization of, uh, of systems. Energy management, this optimization of, of systems is, is something that uh, a lot of industries have looked at. Uh, that, so there is the, the technical substitution of more efficient uh, equipment that can be uh, discussed, but also in terms of fine tuning the activities. The energy management uh, tools and processes can monitor, control and optimize energy performance uh, on an ongoing basis and make changes uh, much more uh, proactively than if you had to uh, replace equipment. And so it means that uh, you can get uh, some significant savings for a small investment. And in this case, we're talking about improvements up in the order of 10% of, uh, uh, within a couple of years of implementation. And this is uh, characteristic of not just the, uh, the uh, industries that we've looked at in Canada, but also of uh, uh, most other industries and in fact, uh, commercial operations as well. There's been a number of case studies and you can see here that uh, uh, the efficiency gains uh, vary over the, the different um, uh, industries, uh, aluminum steel in the 3 to 10 percent range, oil and gas in the 3 to 7.5 percent range, ammonia upwards of 6 percent, pulp and paper interestingly enough upwards of 22 percent. <clears throat> now what, what this suggests is that there still remains a, a number of activities and management protocols that companies can get involved with to improve their energy efficiency uh, without having to make uh, significant changes to their industrial processes. When we consider the investment in energy efficiency, uh, we also have to consider uh, those investments in light of the competitiveness uh, challenges associated with the different sectors. You can see that uh, when we're talking about uh, energy savings uh, for the pulp and paper sector, you can, you can uh, look at a 3% reduction in production costs. That's significant. Uh, iron and steel, 6%. And bitumen extraction, which we haven't talked about, about of about 12%. So there still remains uh, some significant opportunities for companies in these sectors and actually elsewhere to reduce their overall production costs by investing in energy efficiency. Keep in mind again that this is related to the cost effectiveness from a customer's perspective and doesn't consider what other cost effective advantages the the economy might have. So Whereas we're, we're looking at those activities, if the customer paid for the full amount and was, was uh, experiencing the full savings, uh, there's only a few seven to 12 types of technology options available. If governments and utilities were involved, 
and they were looking at the overall system costs for natural gas or for electricity, for example, these uh, production cost reductions could be significantly higher. And this is one area where we think it's important for industry to pay attention. And that is the end state of where the production costs are and how competitive they can be and whether or not energy efficiency can be a competitive advantage uh, in their activities. You can see it here. It's very clear with ammonia production and bitumen extraction in particular that uh, an 8% to 12% production cost reduction can be quite significant. So I wanted to uh, end off uh, my, my uh, formal uh, comments with just some observations. Uh, one of the points that I'd like to note is that <clears throat> uh, carbon pricing uh, has been talked about in a lot of uh, venues across the country. Carbon pricing has, has uh, small impacts on the overall cost of, of systems. Uh, and while uh, companies and various industries and sectors have, have identified concern for any additional costs, uh, we see that carbon pricing has a, a small impact in terms of some of their choices related to energy use. The other point uh, I'd like to stress here is that these energy management systems uh, can be quite cost effective and provide significant savings without much of an, a change in the phys physical manufacturing process. So. Uh, as a uh, initial observation, uh, energy management should be one of the first things that companies consider when they're trying to manage their energy intensity. The other point, uh, the reason why we evaluated the, the uh, energy efficiency options in this way is that the cost effectiveness of the uh, energy options is directly influenced by the retail price. So while these numbers are providing an average for the sector in Canada, we can see that if the retail price for natural gas and electricity varies by province, so too will be the number of uh, options that are cost effective. And then finally, of course, the, the one of the key caveats is uh, if these technology options are not being introduced at the same time as the system or the or the plant is down for other reasons, those the loss of revenues will eliminate uh, or significantly reduce any cost benefits associated with energy efficiency. So it's not just the technologies themselves, it's when they are introduced into the process. With that, that ends the, uh, the formal part of my uh, presentation and we look forward to your text questions using the, the question panel. Oh, I had this note here uh, from that the slide isn't updating. Um, let me just have a quick look here. Okay, so I think it. Uh, are the um, are your analysis on a Canada-wide level, or do we have jurisdictional level? We we have it on a Canada-wide level. We will have some information about uh, individual provinces, uh, mostly in terms of what their uh, average costs of of saved energy will be, as uh, a lot of the technologies and activities uh, are common across the sector, across, across jurisdictions, uh, and you only get to a more customized approach if you look at the individual plants, and we don't have it at a plant level.
one of the other things to keep in mind as we go forward, and I'll just, I, we don't have any additional questions at this point, is uh, I had mentioned before about the challenge associated with the, the cost of energy. And while we see some costs of energy increase, uh, mostly in terms of the infrastructure that's needed, so supplying the natural gas or supplying the electricity, the commodity costs themselves, which is where you find uh, much of the, the financial savings uh, for companies, it has uh, been either stable or going down. Uh, will you share the methodology for assessing cost discount rate? Yes, we will share that. We will identify that in our uh, in our uh, final report. We will also have technical appendices, which we'll go into a little bit more detail about the methodologies, so people can interpret the information uh, with by changing their the the assumptions and discount rates and and identify. Um, uh, particular circumstances. Uh, in terms of the cost of capital, we use a 10% weighted average cost of capital, which is inclusive of debt and equity, which roughly gets you into the range of about 14 to 16% equity return. One of the other points to, to uh, keep in mind about uh, the uh, energy efficiency is that we've only looked at it from a individual technology perspective and kept the rest of the system constant, uh, which means that on a plant by plant basis, there may be additional uh, impacts associated with, with the rest of the, of the process involved. And some of those impacts could be uh, energy savings. Uh, some of those impacts actually could be increased energy use in other aspects of the, of the process. And some of those changes could be related to, to product quality. So when you're looking at uh, plant by plant analysis, these synergistic effects need to be taken into account. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, a weakness associated with doing an average based assessment that you can't take into account these these direct synergistic effects uh, but I can't stress enough that when you're when you're looking at these activities it makes no sense whatsoever from a financial perspective to do any of these activities if you have to disrupt the revenue generating activity of the of the industrial uh, process uh, so in each and all cases, if you're moving forward with uh, energy efficiency options, uh, it needs to be considered within the overall business context. Uh, haven't been any other questions at this point. Uh, I will uh, uh, just remind you that uh, you can provide your questions uh, through text in the questions panel. Uh, I will read out the questions and then uh, uh, provide answers to them. I'll give it a couple of more minutes and, uh, and then we will close off. But why don't I finish off just by identifying uh, some upcoming presentations. We have a couple of other webinars coming up, as you can see here. Uh, on January the 24th, uh, we have a breakfast overview in Calgary, uh, the role of rail in Canada's crude and petrochemical markets. Uh, that's going to be investigating the logistical challenges for crude and petrochemicals used in the rail network. And we were reminded of how important that is when we had the very short term strike a little while ago, and that created a lot of concern across the country. Uh, also on February 11th, we have a webinar 
uh, and this is on Canada's oil and gas regulatory framework and whether or not it's competitive compared to other jurisdictions. And in the particular case that we're looking at is the United States. And that's because that's one of our main competitors, uh, not only in terms of the, the export of oil and gas, but also for the attraction of investment. All right, just a, a couple more minutes, and and we'll uh, and we'll call it uh, a webinar. Uh, just so you know, you can download the presentation um, uh, through the handouts panel. Uh, the other thing is, we're always open to having discussions with uh, your companies and colleagues, and and. Uh, um, uh, if you're looking for more in-depth uh, presentations on, on any of our work, uh, please contact us at info at siri.ca and also that uh, we'll, we will email them a copy of the presentation uh, in case you're having problems downloading it through the handouts page. We really appreciate your attendance. Uh, thank you for your interest. And if there's anything more we can do, please get in touch with us. Thank you very much.